Welcome to the Speed and Scale podcast. I'm your host, Baybars Orsek. Today, I'm very happy and excited, not just because we are publishing the sixth episode of the show, but also that I will be joined by a very good friend of mine, a former colleague whom I had the chance to work together at the Pointer Institute for a couple of years and learned a lot from his vision and his commitment in making a difference in the mid space. When I started at a fact-checking organization in my home country, launched it back in 2014, and then started my next chapter at the Pointer Institute as a director of the International fact Check Network, my understanding on the media literacy was pretty much limited to providing various set of trainings, resources to the people to make sure that they could be better prepared on what's coming on their news feeds. But what Alex and his colleagues at MediaWise taught me was that it is actually much beyond that and it is probably one of the highest impact interventions against mis- and disinformation. So I will benefit a lot from this conversation as you will hear very soon. And I hope that's gonna be the case for you as well. We talked about um, anything and everything basically around mid literacy, the role of generative AI, uh, the challenges and opportunities that it generates. And on a more personal level, what brought Alex into the mid literacy space? What keeps him awake at night and how he's rightfully concerned about the future of the internet and what could be done in order to prevent um, the erosion of trust in our institutions. So without further ado, um, I invite you to join me for this conversation and share your comments and feedback on the, uh, the platforms that you are getting this podcast from. Hey, Alex, welcome to the show. Really great to be here, Baybars. Great. Wonderful to have you here. So I'm not going to pretend that you and I don't know each other, but for the sake of our listeners, I think it would be great if you can walk us through your background, what brought you into the mid address space, and what has been the last couple of years for you as a director of MediaWise. Yeah, so... Uh- Alex Mahadevan, the director of MediaWise. Uh, yeah, we go way back, uh, Bay Bars. Um, so, uh, MediaWise, which is based at the Pointer Institute, um, I've been at Pointer since 2019. And prior to that, I was a, a data journalist at a um, digital news outlet. And then I spent most of my career in local news around um, the Gulf Coast of Florida. And I did really everything around newsrooms. So I started out as a local government reporter. I was going to tree advisory council meetings and county commission meetings, planning board meetings, et cetera. And eventually I kind of worked my way into an audience engagement role where I was overseeing social media. I was, um, you know, helping transition uh, my newspaper, the Observer newspaper into a new content management system. And so throughout all of this, the through line with that work that I was doing was I was engaging a lot with the audience. And so um, I was interfacing with um, a lot of people online through comments uh, on the website, through Facebook comments. Um, And I, you know, this was around 2015 and 2016. So you remember what happened in the US in 2015, 2016. It's pretty, you know, pretty, pretty big couple of years there. And, um, you know, throughout this process, what I noticed is I was seeing a lot of the uh, misinformation and, and frankly, disinformation that was being um, spread at the national level by a presidential candidate, Donald Trump, filtering down into the local level. So I was seeing these Facebook comments on some of our news stories from like neighbors that I knew from neighborhood association meetings that were totally misinformed, completely false. And I was just baffled by it. And, and it always stuck with me. And it wasn't until 2019, um, the company I was at previously went through a round of layoffs and I was, you know, kind of looking for my next gig that I saw a job listing for MediaWise. And it was this brand new media literacy initiative based out of Pointer, um, total startup mentality. You know, the, the former director came from, from Snap and it just seemed like a really cool opportunity and it combined everything that I was passionate about. So it combined audience engagement with, um, you know, tackling misinformation online um, to, uh, you know, working at a place like Pointer that I had always really looked up to, you know, I did it, I was at a census training when the layoffs were announced at my last job. So it just made a lot of sense. And, 
you know, ever since then, I, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, misinformation has become, you know, a, a very regular part of my life. Yeah, I think it's fair to say that it's a curse and a blessing to be in this space. But I think it's a privilege for the space to have you. And um, we just had a brief introduction to MediaWise. Um, and I had the chance to uh, watch MediaWise from its almost its inception and see, you know, where it has reached under your leadership. Um, and what I try to do in this podcast is to make sure that um, the conversations that we have is useful and full of takeaways for those who are listening this out of the US as well. Um, and MediaWise has been a shining star uh, for a lot of different organizations that are interested in the media literacy space. Um, can you walk us through a bit on like, you know, what MediaWise has been doing and especially on your latest um, recent expansion into the global um, settings and how does that work out for you so far at MediaWise? Everything we're doing internationally from a massive project we're launching in Bulgaria to reach teenagers, college students, and, and older adults to work we've done in Spain and your home, you know, Turkey and Istanbul. It all comes back to um, the philosophy from when we originally started in 2018, 2019, and that is to create media literacy resources tailored for specific demographics, reaching people with the fact-checking mindset, with people they trust, colleagues they trust, in the case of our teen fact-checking network, with messages that resonate with them. So ever since MediaY started, we've created courses, webinars, videos, workshops that have been customized for the audience we're trying to reach. A big part of our early work was teenagers. So we did a ton of work on Instagram and eventually TikTok. Now we are like huge on TikTok. But this kind of echoes into what we're doing internationally. So when we, when we launched uh, our international expansion in 2022 in Brazil, France, Spain, and Turkey, we had to take that mindset. So our goal has always been to um, partner with local organizations, usually fact-checking organizations, um, and find really trusted ambassadors, whether they be journalists or in the case of our work in Guatemala, a, a sports star, a badminton star, um, uh, and, and uh, help them reach their audiences with um, skills to separate fact from fiction online. And now, you know, what, the role we play is we've spent so much time um, crafting you know, a very specific uh, fact-checking focused media literacy uh, curriculum. We were originally founded working closely with the Stanford History Education Group, their civic online reasoning uh, curriculum, which is based off of studying how fact-checkers navigate the internet. Now, MediaWise has always been lucky that my office is literally like 20 feet from the editor-in-chief of PolitiFact. So over the last four or five years, we've really moved alongside fact checkers in, in, in implementing what fact checkers are doing into our training. So what we're always trying to do is um, take, you know, the kind of innovative things that MediaWise does with teenagers through our teen fact checking network, through ambassadors, um, you know, celebrities and journalists and help local partners in, um, you know, right now it's like eight plus countries do the same where they are. Because we always recognize, again, going back to misinformation, reaching different people in different ways and affecting them in different ways, media literacy needs to do the same. So, um, you know, it, it doesn't matter if it's a, if it's a program for older adults, like we launched in Spain, you know, we, we did a, a WhatsApp media literacy course in Spain, or it is a, a teen fact checking network that we're going to be launching in Canada or that we've done in India and, and Germany and, and Brazil. So we, we really like to, to take our kind of innovative eye and partner with, um, you know, local organizations who can really help us reach the demographics that need media literacy the most. A few weeks ago, I had an interview with 
Dean Jackson and John Bateman, the co-authors of the the Countering Disinformation Effectively Policy Guide published by the Carnegie uh, Endowment for International Peace. And in their uh, policy brief, they go through 10 different interventions uh, in uh, tackling disinformation. And one of them just stood up um, and it was media, media literacy because like, apart from all other interventions, their finding was that media literacy is the one that has the most literature review. The highest understanding that we have on any of those interventions are about is about media literacy. It is the one that um, there is such a consensus on its impact. But the challenge that they raise is that it's very hard to scale. And I think that makes a lot of sense in your case as well, because all of those audiences that you cater to and try to serve requires various tactics and uh, ways in which you engage with those audiences. And I was just wondering, uh, as you said, um, media-wise, even your interest in media literacy and media-wise inception was as a response to more local or like national uh, needs in the U.S. But then it expanded internationally, and I believe there's a lot of um, back and forth between those takeaways and understanding of like and how media literacy works. I, I will. I'm very curious in your take on like how do you think this international collaboration or experience sharing helps media literacy to scale up um, and become a much more um, long term um, intervention um, apart from all other different ways to tackle this information. Well, that, that, that's a really good question. And, and I absolutely agree with, with all of their assessments there. I'm biased, obviously, because I'm the director of a media literacy organization here. Um, but I think the, the international collaboration is just kind of, it was, it was the next logical step in trying to scale um, media literacy interventions. And I think the, the, the challenge right now is there's not a really great universal way to study media literacy uh, uh, efficacy. Uh, there, there's just not a end-all be-all test you can give a person and say, listen, this person now is better at separating fact from fiction, or this person is now uh, a better digital citizen. You know, So I think, I, I think what this international collaboration allows us to do is to start bringing together forces from around the world to try to move toward an international global way of studying the efficacy of media literacy. Now, we, we've studied that. We have a long time partnership with Stanford University. We launched a lab with them, the Empowering Diverse Digital Citizens Lab that specifically studies um, media wise media literacy interventions, very US based. But we've worked with the University of Navarra in Spain to study the WhatsApp course there. We worked with um, uh, uh, academic institutions in uh, Brazil and, uh, and, and, and Turkey as well. And, you know, those three organizations have gotten together and they're working with Stanford now on what they're calling kind of this massive global study to try to look at how these interventions have worked, what worked in one place, what didn't work in another place. And so I think you know, the more international programs we can launch, we're always thinking, you know, how can we get closer to a, um, a global solution? It's kind of um, uh, counterintuitive, right? Because I said that misinformation reaches people in different ways and they need, you know, different approaches to media literacy. But I think there is a, a, there are foundational principles that you can teach people. And I think we're getting closer to to figuring out you know what is a good blueprint that we can scale to other countries so um you know right now we're we're working on a i can't say too much about it but we're working on a, a curriculum and a blueprint that our goal would be it could be easily scalable to any country they can grab it and they can it's for um, young people and, and uh, uh young adults and they can easily take this curriculum and, you know, in a matter of a few days, put together a workshop or, uh, heck, launch their own teen fact-checking network. So uh, in, in the U.S., our approach to scale was let's work with the platforms and use our expertise on social media to reach a million plus people. And we did that really well. We did it really, really well on Facebook, on Instagram. 
TikTok has blown up. You know, we have more than 150,000 followers on TikTok. We regularly go, I, you know, I, I will say we regularly go viral with uh, fact checks on the Maui fires or, I don't know, um, misinformation about pigeons carrying drugs. So in the U.S., it's always been let's use the platforms and, and figure out how to reach as many people as possible. Internationally, we're taking a more targeted approach because we're working with local partners and we may not be, you know, um, you know, blasting everything out there the way we did, you know, in the U.S. on Facebook and, and Instagram and TikTok. But I think overall, we are working toward that global scale of uh, uh, media literacy. And, and what, what I love is that, you know, my colleague, Brittany Kohler, the deputy director of MediaWise, She's been regularly leading meetings of dozens of media literacy organizations. You know, we call it kind of informally the Global Media Literacy Network. And we share knowledge. Um, we share uh, uh, really cool interventions that organizations are working on. So I think, you know, I, I, I really am feeling very positive about the collaboration amongst uh, media literacy organizations, many of which are arms of fact checkers, which is, you know, really cool. And I don't know, I, I'm excited to see, you know, what the next few years bring as we do more research, as we launch more programs. Right. Um, well, I think we've heard this many times that media literacy or pre-banking as an exercise is a new fact-checking, not just in the form of the, the practice itself, but the ways in which it attracts interest from the researcher community or from the funders. So there's a lot of uh, eyeballs on media literacy right now, as there was a lot on fact-checking a decade ago. Still, there are, but I guess it's fair to say that media literacy is the, uh, the, the, the new uh, talk of the town. What I see the difference between the two is uh, fact-checking has been traditionally more reactive. And I also had this conversation with Bill Adair uh, to ask him elaborate on why he calls for a reboot, basically, for fact checkers and reinvent ways to uh, communicate their work with people who need it the most. He calls to be uh, he calls the community to be much more proactive. But media literacy from the get go has always been more um, proactive uh, rather than reactive, and. Another part, I guess, is like, you know, the claims that fact checkers focus on versus the narratives that the media literacy practitioners are first spend much more time on uh, grappling with. What are the main narratives that you see the media literacy is uh, providing that um, impact um, ahead of all these elections that we see this year? I mean, we have elections uh, this year here in the U.S., we have uh, the largest election in the world in India in a, in, a, in a month of time. And we have Europe-wide parliamentary elections, both on the national level and also on the EU level and in the UK. I mean, this is the year of elections. What have you been capturing as the main narratives as uh, media-wise to tackle this uh, problem at large ahead of all those elections? Well, we're we're really lucky to be, again, working with Telemundo, which is a... a, a Spanish language broadcaster uh, here in the U.S., but they, you know, they're active. They're active actually all over the world, and we are um, updating our our resources for Spanish speakers. It's called MediaWise in Español, and uh, so we're doing right now. Just this month, this last few weeks, we're doing kind of a crash course in figuring out what should we be focused on. What are the themes we're seeing? And I think the the number one is um, you know reinforcing the integrity of elections. And I think getting out ahead of election misinformation and election disinformation, um, I think that's going to be a huge issue here in the U.S. Um, I'd imagine it's kind of spread, you know, worldwide. I, I admittedly have a, a pretty U.S. focus uh, um, uh, point of view on this, um, but I'm trying to branch out. But, uh, you know, so so focusing on getting out ahead of you know, let's say misinformation about absentee ballots. You know, there, we know, fact checkers know that there's going to be a ton of misinformation with people like sharing a picture of their absentee ballot saying, I got a second absentee ballot and it, you know, means that there's been fraud in the election, blah, blah, blah. So our goal is like to create a video now uh, for Spanish speakers starring, starring Telemundo's Julio Vaquero or Jose Diaz-Balart that explains, listen, uh, 
misinformation is is really effective because it manipulates your emotions and your fear and your civic duty about the elections. You might see misinformation about absentee ballots um, being a cause for concern about fraud. Here are the reasons that that's false. And also, here is a technique you can use when you see an image like this online. Do a reverse image search. So we're like we're focused on getting out ahead of the election uh, uh, integrity misinformation. Immigration is a big thing in the U.S. Uh, and elsewhere. I, th- I think um, you know you see it in Europe. Uh, immigration is really weaponized because it's really easy to um, to uh, um, to try to make uh, immigrants look look bad and kind of uh, uh, otherize them, so to speak. So um, another big area we're focused on is misinformation around the border and you know what politicians are saying about whether we have wide open borders or um you know all these criminals are coming through again we know we're going to see a lot of mis and disinformation about immigration so we're trying to build that into all of the resources we're doing health misinformation is rampant still i mean what we just saw there's um uh a a, a very famous a univision doctor who someone like changed his voice or like might have deep faked his voice in a Facebook video and in the in this like you know false AI type video um hit, what he was saying was totally changed to him saying he found like a secret weight loss drug or something so like health misinformation is also something we get out of, out ahead of the cool thing about media literacy and um why I think it's so scalable is that all of the foundational techniques you teach, whether it's pre-bunking, teaching someone to stay aware of their emotions and manipulation tactics, or skills-based, teaching them how to do an effective Google search or a reverse image search, are foundational. So you can plug and play the examples depending on what you are trying to pre-bunk against. So for example, in Texas, in the US, there were all these terrible wildfires. And Fact checkers know every time there's a climate disaster that misinformation is going to spread. And you know there's going to be misinformation saying that fires were started by space lasers because we saw this when the fires were happening in Maui. So what's really cool is now I can take some of the videos that our teen fact checking network did during the Maui fires and we can just reshare that. You know, on on Twitter or, or or on TikTok and say, you know, it's the same deal. So uh, that that's what I like about uh, about media literacy and, and how 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 it can really effectively get out ahead of this misinformation. Um, but you you know you and and Bill have a have a good point. And what I think is I don't I don't think that I don't I don't think these have to exist separately. Fact checking and media literacy. I I think and I think media literacy can be a, a part of any fact check. PolitiFact does it really well where they, you know, list their sources, they, you know, explain how they, you know, track down a quote or a study or um, just straight up called up a politician and got the, you know, the real story. Um, so I, I think infusing media literacy and pre-bunking into fact checking can be can be really effective in and of itself. Uh, that wasn't surprising for me to hear that you again proactively tackle the narrative that suggests that um, fact checkers are going to run out of business because of media literacy programs. So I appreciate that because, I mean, I agree with you, like they can and need to coexist. Um, and I think they, I mean, there is a lot of room to um, complement each other um, for media literacy and fact checking. And I think that's what we, what we've been seeing lately um, as well. And that's just very promising. Uh, one thing that I'm curious about your thought is um, tools. You are working with everyday individuals and empowering them with tools and skills to be their own fact checkers, right? Or their own media literacy experts. Uh, there is a conversation that I'm really interested in um, hearing your thoughts on this trade off between security and access. And this is particularly in the age of Gen AI, where it is super easy and cheap to generate deep fakes, cheap fakes, um, and it's basically a tool to 
deceive people ahead of elections, not just about election integrity, but as you said, around health misinformation, climate misinformation. And one of the ways in which it is suggested that we can be better prepared um, against the dangers of generative AI misinformation is to provide people with the tools to identify inauthentic content. There's a lot of work happening at the moment around uh, provenance or uh, content authenticity, but a big part of that relies on experts and the knowledge community. Um, do you agree with some of the concerns that people like Sam Gregory and others raise about Providing people with the tools will eventually empower the bad actors with the ta- with the with the skills and the know how to uh, overcome those measures and be better at what they do. Almost like it's an arms arms race. Do you agree with that concern? I yeah, hundred percent agree with that concern. And 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 I you know I I don't the. I'm always wary of a tech solution to a tech problem because there's always money in tech, whether it is a problem or a solution. So there's always going to be someone chasing a really cheap and easy buck in the tech solution to a tech problem. And so with, with what we teach, I will listen, I'll go to a newsroom and I'll tell them, Hey, um, you know, this hive app is relatively decent at spotting Gen AI images, I, I would never rely on it fully. But the, the truth is, there's never going to be an end all be all technology for identifying Gen AI. Um, I don't think there will ever be a, a tech solution that can uh, outpace the bad actors. Like you made a good point. So, everything that we teach, you know, the foundational media literacy skills, identifying the source of a post or video or image, um, uh, weighing the evidence of what they're saying and um, checking out multiple sources uh, about the topic, whether that's like the AI Pope looking for a bunch of different outlets, seeing what they're reporting on the AI Pope. Um, All of those are still going to work as the technology advances, you know, because um, you can always teach people to be skeptical of a source and try to track down, you know, the, the, the Twitter user who shared the gen AI video or the TikTok user. Bad actors always leave breadcrumbs. I mean, you're you're a fact checker. You know this. Like, it, like there is, there's no anonymity online anymore, and you will get, you can get tracked down. And, and I think with the foundational skill, media literacy skills that that MediaWise teaches, we don't have to do a whole lot of updating for AI, and we don't have to rely on tools for teaching people how to identify generative AI. We just teach them, hey, listen, if you see something online and it and it makes you feel emotional, stop. Uh, check out the bio of the TikTok user. There's a good chance the bio of that TikTok user is going to be extremely sketchy. It might have a link to sell you something. Um, start Googling around. You know, I mean, news outlets, what I'll say is, uh, especially an outlet called 404 Media, uh, have been really great at covering the latest in uh, AI scams and AI, you know, fiascos. So I think you know, really teaching, teaching people to be critical uh, consumers of information, stop being passive, being really active about your online use, you're, you're going to be able to, to, to get past this generative AI nonsense. It is particularly challenging when you have like, you know, I mean, all the platforms have different policies, different attitudes towards their trust and safety efforts. And you are trying to offer a foundational model that can help people to um, accumulate literacy skills. But when it comes to um, turning them into uh, reality, I mean, then you have all the platforms, right? Like they have different uh, policies, different guidelines. How that's like challenging for you as a social media first, if not a social media only program to tackle misinformation through media research programs because you have to develop all those interventions almost tailor-made for each and every single platform and the headwinds that we see within the platform space i guess doesn't make that any easier uh but what's happening with x under musk's leadership 
and other platforms trying to navigate this as they go. Uh, what, what has been the biggest challenge for you to operate this multi-platform approach to reach out to those audiences? Apart from all those, you know, messaging apps, you know, text um, courses and everything, like in terms of, as an audience engagement um, expert, uh, I, I would like to hear your pain points on how to deal with those ever-changing landscape of the platforms. Well, I definitely will not say I'm an expert because back in the day, it was just take a URL. This was like 2013. <laughs> take a URL and post it on Facebook, post it on Twitter. And uh, hell, I don't even, I mean, I don't even think we did anything with Instagram back then. So not an expert, but I will say uh, that everything, all of the challenges that we face on platforms, every publisher in the entire world is facing. And that is anytime there's a tweak to the algorithm, uh, there is a possibility that our videos don't reach as many people. Um, anytime there is some sort of, uh, y- you know, change in guidelines about topics, sometimes, and I think you've, you've got to have seen this, sometimes topics that fact checkers cover can get caught up in uh, trust and safety nets and get taken away. You know what I mean? So like sometimes we might get a video that's taken down because the topic is too similar to election disinformation. We're debunking it, but it's just too similar. So I think sometimes um, uh, you know a challenge is getting caught up in overeager uh, uh, moderation, which I'm like totally in favor. With. I'm I'm always happy, and I'm happy when that happens. But I think um, trying to stay up with the the audience and where they are um, and the demands of each platform. So you know I think we've been really lucky that. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to say this and regret it. Maybe we've been really lucky that Meta likes to follow other platforms (laughs) because, you know, TikTok got huge and then Instagram Reels was, you know, doing a lot of the the same thing. So we're able to do a lot of cross posting and get, you know, some pretty good engagement that way. But, um, you know, when, when the, when the platforms tweak things like, you know, Facebook, um, um, downgrading news and the algorithm is obviously, you know, a pain, um, pushing people into private groups on Facebook. It's been difficult to address misinformation that way. So it it's tough being at the whim of a few very influential people at a few very influential companies. But, um, you know, on the flip side, there are really great, you know, trust and safety professionals at all these platforms that have done a lot to promote media literacy that have done, done a lot to support fact checking and you know there's always someone on the inside who has our best interest at heart and is fighting for it and so i think we've we've gotten lucky in that sense but it's hard it, it, the news industry is um you know it, ever since the the rise of craigslist which you know and then the rise of google after that and web 2.0 with social media we've all just gotten so reliant on platforms for audience and so it's like it's a little bit our fault too for getting too reliant on that. Right. Um, I mean, yeah, the platforms get a lot of heat, you know, for all the right reasons. But I mean, I don't think we praise enough for those unsung heroes that we have been able to work with um, at those platforms to introduce some of these programs and uh, be able to just reach out to those audiences. I think we really need to take like the opportunity to give them the credit they deserve. How about the AI frontier companies? I mean, have you been able to build, if not similar, but at least meaningful relationships with those who are at OpenAI, Anthropic, or Google, or other like you know uh, LLMs that are uh, being developed as we speak right now? I mean, is this something that the media research space has been keeping an eye on? Is it too early, or do you get some sort of like you know mixed signals that tells you that? they are not looking at that um, place yet. Uh, where are we with Genetive AI? Because we talked about its challenges. Do you see any opportunities there, even from a research standpoint or from a partnership standpoint? So to answer your question about whether we've made any headway with partnerships, no. And if anyone from OpenAI or Anthropic or Twitter's Grok, <laughs> give me a call. Give me a call because I'd, I'd love to... 
I'd love to talk to you about how we can uh, do some good media literacy work on in, in spaces where we are kind of seeing the next frontier of mis and disinformation, and it's um, rightfully scaring a lot of people about how quick it is to create a, a very plausible, um, fake, shaky cell phone video of war footage. You know, so um, we haven't ha- made any headway. What I'll say is, you know, a company like OpenAI seems to be throwing a very paltry amount of money toward publishers right now and trying to, um, you know, make inroads with partnerships with news organizations. The AP is a good example, Axel Springer, um, you know, a few others. Um, it, it made a, a, a big grant to the American Journalism Project to support some local uh, AI initiatives. So I think they're doing a little bit to kind of say, hey, we're, we're here for you, news organizations. But I think we just like at the very beginning in the rise of social media platforms, now is the time to be very wary of these partnerships with these AI companies. And, um, you know, we don't want to get into the position that we were in in the past where we are completely reliant on a single platform, ChatGPT, to reach our audience, Bing, to reach our audience, or Gemini to reach our audience. Um, So um, now is the time to be like really experimenting with these tools, figuring out how you can um, uh, use them for good. And, um, you know, I mean, <clears throat> it, I see, a, I, I am not an AI doomsayer. Um, I see a lot of opportunity in, in AI. What generative AI has the ability to do is create a lot of content that's targeted to specific people. Now that sounds a lot like how we approach media literacy. And, you know, I mean, it, what what we found is that the best media literacy interventions work when they're tailored to individual demographics. And we just don't have the resources to go out every day and create a new course for um, like folks in El Salvador or, um, you know, reach out and uh, create a course in Albania but with AI, I think there's a lot of opportunity in being able to create a ton, a ton of media literacy content that is specifically tailored. I'm talking language. I'm talking um, the AI. You can create AI generated anchors. So um, you know the ethics of doing all this are still being worked out. But I, I see, I do see AI as a, a pretty big opportunity in scaling media literacy interventions across the world. Now we got to. We got to figure out the ethics first. And my colleague, Kelly McBride here at Pointer is, is hard at work on setting up some ethical frameworks for the use of AI. But, um, you know, and, and on, on the other side, you brought it up earlier. I just wanted to, I wanted to um, harp on the, you know, provenance work and the watermarking and the content authenticity initiative. I think it's, I think it's all really great work and they're really brilliant minds, but I'm still yet to see how unless platforms ban all images that don't have uh, a watermark or every bad actor agrees to use the watermark, <laughs> then I don't understand how watermarking is the future of, of fighting AI mis- and disinformation. So that, that will fall on fact checkers. I think fact checkers and journalists are really going to be on the front lines of fighting AI mis- and disinformation um, in the future. Yeah, it's a challenge. What if all the uh, content generated by AI has the same watermark and then it becomes impossible to filter Mm -hmm. uh, the actual ones from the the fake ones? Um, All right, I'm just going to wrap this up, but I cannot end this conversation without asking you this. You sort of like touched on this. But I want to hear what wakes you awake at night when you look at all these elections happening, especially the one in the U.S. in a, in a I think like seven or eight months uh, from now on. And what would be your selling pitch for those who are in the journalism field but are interested in entering the media space? What has been your uh, not motivation? Because I know what your motivation is, but what has been your driving? feel to do this work uh during this very hectic uh and interesting years <laughs> well i i have kind of uh counter I, another counterintuitive answer here so the thing that keeps me up at night is what is 
an incredibly overly skeptical and um, disengaged world. Um, I'm worried that we're going to get to a world where there's so much AI slime out there and so much misinformation that people are skeptical of everything they see. They don't believe anything, any government official, any politician, any friend, family member says. Everything is questioned. And that, what I concern is, well, I think that could turn people off. Um, my biggest fear, like when I look at the next five years is, are we going to see AI completely um, like are, just destroy the will of people to be good information and news consumers? In five years, are we going to see record low voting turnout? That's my big my my biggest fear is voting turnout around the world um, after the you know the revolution of AI missing disinformation driven by an overly skeptical and beleaguered and tired audience. So my counterintuitive, what, what really drives me is I do see people getting more skeptical, which is good. Like it, like I do, I, what, what keeps me going and drives and motivates me is I see the, um, you know, the, the look on, um, like an older adult Joe's face when I'm doing a presentation for AARP and, and I teach him how to open a new tab and, and search for this, uh, uh, fact check about this miracle COVID cure. And he's like, Oh, I didn't realize I could do that. And I just know now he's going to question every scam that comes in front of him. I, I, I can't even, you cannot calculate the amount of money we've saved like older adults by teaching them how to not fall for scams, you know, and, and the public health. So I think what keeps me motivated is um, media literacy is a very effective solution to the misinformation problem. And the misinformation problem is something that is degrading our democracy. It's killing people and hurting the public health. And it is creating a polarized society where it's becoming nearly impossible to talk to someone that you think has a different political background. Media literacy is the cure to all of these things. And I think if we are able to scale media literacy really effectively, we're able to um, find that sweet spot where we can measure globally media literacy effectiveness. I think we can start working on um, new studies where we specifically tie media literacy to um, civic discourse, to voting turnout. So um, what, what keeps me going is I hope that in five years, we have research studies showing that not only does media literacy help people uh, classify false and true headlines, but it also increases the amount of civic participation and it increases the um, amount of um, civil public discourse that we have. Alex, thank you so much. It was great to have you on the show. It was wonderful to see you and, and talk to you, old friend. Thank you for listening to the Speed and Scale podcast. I'll be with another guest next week to discuss another important topic around our information integrity. I see you on the next one. <laughs>